Welcome again to the DS Incubator. Today we are going to be talking about data science on a Chromebook. It is a meetup that lasts only today. It's a fun meetup and it is inspired by the blog post uh, by Jeff Leak in 2017, Data Science on a Chromebook, and also by my urgent need to uh, use a computer when my main computer broke down. It's right now in the workshop. I've been using this Chromebook for about a week now, maybe a little more, and I'm having a lot of fun. So it, I would like to talk today to data science scientists in general, including analysts and software developers, which uh, we usually think that we might need a super powerful computer. And for um, and today I, I'm hoping to demonstrate that uh, we can get away with something very lightweight. Um, uh, so this meetup will uh, help you if you are like me and your main station, main uh, computing station broke down, uh, or if you are interested in saving a few dollars. Maybe you want to get started in data science, but you find that uh, um, like a, a normal computer is too expensive. Uh, today I'm going to show you how you can you can get started with not so much money. So first I'm going to be overviewing my Chromebook. Then I'm going to be showing how you can start. Uh, by using a computer uh, online uh, with unlimited resources or resources that you buy on demand or you rent on demand from cloud providers like DigitalOcean, for example. And third, I'm going to be talking about how to set up your own uh, Chromebook uh, to work offline. And that is when uh, the limitations are going to be exposed. You're going to be limited to the very little resources that your computer uh, has. So let's start by talking a bit about the laptop that I am having uh, here on my hands. It's uh, it costed 120 bucks on Amazon. Uh, it has only two cores uh, compared to my main station, which has maybe five or seven, I think. Uh, four gigabytes of memory of RAM memory. My main computer has I think 32 gigabytes of memory, and only 64 gigabytes of storage. Uh, my main computer has uh, I think half of a terabyte. So as you can see, this is much, much smaller than my main computer. And um, um, and it's not a problem for Chrome OS. Uh, it's the software, uh, the operating system that uh, this computer is running. Um, maybe with these very limited resources, we wouldn't be able to run uh, Windows or, or Mac OS, uh, at least not the latest versions of them. But Chrome OS is super lightweight. It's based on apps. It, has, uh, it comes already with a few apps. Uh, I'm going to show you some here. Um, and it works pretty much like a, um, like an iPad or a tablet. The keyboard is pretty lean. Uh, I'm going to click here to show you an image of the keyboard that uh, I have. Uh, there are a few keys that I was used to using uh, on my other computer and I lack here. For example, the caps lock doesn't exist. Instead, I have to press uh, Alt and uh, the search key. Hopefully, while this refresh, refreshes um, well, I can make my point anyway. Um, there you go. So this this search key is uh, you use it for a bunch of things and uh, to uh, for example to lock caps you do Alt and that key uh, or to do Dell you don't have Dell as you can see you have to press Alt and backspace um, and what else uh, you don't have a right click so if you if you click here nothing happens what you have to do is Alt and um, and click or the, with two fingers a tap. So that is uh, maybe similar to what Mac users are used to. Um, it was, uh, it, you know, it took me a little bit to get used to that, but it's fine, I'm very happy with this, uh, with, with this very simple keyboard. Give me a sec, I need to uh, here say that I'm still in the call. In the call. Well, so back to the notes, um, the file system, it looks like this. Let me open the files app. Uh, and here you see that there's two types of files. Local files, here in my files, and uh, online files on Google Drive. So you log in here to with your um, Google account. I'm logging in here with one account. You could add more if you want. And uh, by doing so, then uh, immediately you have access to the Google Drive associated to that Google account. Right. So um, these files uh, that you can see here on my drive are not actually locally stored. They are online and this is just a view of them. Uh, unless you uh, choose specifically for a particular file, 
uh, to be displayed online and in that case uh, offline in that case you have it you have a copy offline but not not by default uh, and in my files usually you have just downloads I did something that I'm going to explain in a bit so that I also have Linux files I'm going to explain that in a moment let's close this up uh, and that was the overview that I wanted to share with you so now let's get to work so now we have this Chromebook it looks like as I have just explained how do we actually do that science with it the easiest way would be to use a computer on the cloud something that you already set up on for example digital ocean I have one here that I'm used for um, our studio you can see this is a, a website and I log in to this uh, computer with uh, a username and a secure password uh, and only I can access there and um, in this in this computer um, I, I do actual work and I can make it bigger or smaller depending on my needs with that I'm gonna be paying more or less depending on all the resources that I want so I'm not gonna explain how to set one up here because I covered that in a series about cloud computing so you see you could see the videos about um, you know from this DS incubators um, playlist the videos about cloud computing so there I show how to set up a computer on the cloud and how to scale your computing resources up and down but the long story short is that once you do that setup you can get um, pretty much from the web browser access to a, a limitless computer okay so I'm gonna close that then the what rest is okay what do you do when you are offline so if uh, you are on the plane or you know you don't have internet or whatever you may wanna still work so the Chrome um, book doesn't come with developer tools but you can set a developer environment here a, a link to instructions from uh, from um, from Chrome OS actually to, to see how that works but that's that's um, um, you know a little too detailed in short what you want to do is you know go to your settings um, so you can pop up the settings from here or uh, as usual go to the apps settings is no more and no less than an app so you can start typing settings or you find it there on the icons and click there and uh, you can find for uh, developer tools here right so you can start typing dev developers and there you go and in developers you will find the section about Linux development environment so I have already set one up it's super simple just click uh, to, to create one and everything happens for you you will have to choose or later change this the amount of this space that you want to reserve for that system because what you'll be doing is basically splitting your um, disk uh, so that one part of the disk is going to host the Chrome OS as, as it came and the other part is going to host this Linux system so two systems inside the same computer but you need to see, say how much space you want for each so I chose 30 gigabytes for my Linux environment and another 30 and a little more for Chrome OS with that uh, I think um, you know I, I made that decision so that I have enough space to install Docker on my Linux environment so that then can use docker to install any other software that I need uh, and the images the docker images um, usually can go up to you know the ones that I use can go up to a, a few gigabytes maybe three or four gigabytes so they're pretty large so I need uh, certainly more than the recommended this space that I read here it recommends uh, Chrome OS recommends 10 gigabytes but you know I need I need more so uh, that's how you um, yeah, yeah you set that up so once you do that then you can find the terminal app which appears once you have completed that setup let me move this out of here out of the way and uh, you see this little window the one that you want to click is here on penguin you get a penguin uh, terminal it's starting now and here it is uh, it's a little small so i'm going to do Control plus to make this a little bigger i could do pwd a command to print the working directory here you can see what's my home directory so the so there is a terminal here right so that's that's the beginning next uh, you may want to see okay how do I how can you access files from Linux that live on your um, on your Chrome OS side of the system right so um, and the other way around so if you pop up the files app
you can see that um, under my files, I see the Linux files, but uh, if you want from Linux to access um, the Chrome files, like for example, the ones that I unlock in downloads, you have to, you know, kind of option click on the on, on the folder that you want to share. In my case, I option clicked on, on uh, my files, so the entire, um, the top level directory in my Chrome OS system. And, and there is where you can choose your uh, how to manage the Linux sharing. So basically here is where you say, yes, I want to share uh, the entire directory with Linux. And uh, it's going to be mounted on the uh, normal place on mount. So let me show you how that works. So on Linux, you would do an ls on mount. Uh, and there you will see that there is a directory called Chrome OS. Uh, and there is my files. So inside my files, there is the downloads that uh, we were talking about. Right, so downloads, uh, that's, you know, you can see all the files that you can download, which you can also see from uh, files, from the files app. Just to convince ourselves of that. So we have this view of the content of downloads from the terminal. And now, well, this the freshest, refreshes, there you go. Uh, if I click on downloads, the same files appear here. All right, so there is this communication between the two systems that uh, that we have. So now back to the notes. Uh, so again, okay, we install the development environment. We um, are sharing some files so we can move things around between systems. And, and now what I could do is install Docker engine. Uh, here is a link to the instructions from Docker on how to do it. And here is a link to the DS incubator series dedicated to Docker. And uh, that's where you can see uh, how to use Docker, in particular, you'll see how to use it with uh, images from the Rocker project. So here is a link to using the uh, image Rocker pairs. What does that do? Well, with that, you can create, um, basically, let me show you here. So I have this, this environment, right? And now I can use Docker uh, to um, do a bunch of things, including list all the images uh, that are running inside containers here. Uh, I'm running a container called Verse. Uh, inside and uh, from that started from an image uh, from the Rockerverse project, uh, and that is here at this address. In uh, I chose this address in particular. So what you need to do is simply to point your web browser to that address, and and there you will have uh, an instance of R Studio server running, and that is local. You don't need an internet connection. So if I go to that um, address. Here you log in with a um, with a username and the password that you chose for that particular um, container when you created it. And what you're gonna see is something very similar to what you saw um, before, except that now we are logging, we're working locally, so we could be offline and still be able to uh, start this um, instance of our studio server. Uh, you can, of course, you know, go to the instructions to install our studio server on your, sorry, this is taking a little while, but you know, have a few th th things to say in the, mean, in the meantime. So uh, you, there you go. So you, you could install our studio server directly on your Linux environment as opposed to using a Docker image, but I find it more uh, clean to do it th you know, through Docker. Why? Because you know you made um, first because the instructions are kind of uh, awkward, and you can trust that the images from Rockerverse did it well. And second, because if you can dispose a container very easily, uh, but you know once um, and then or maybe reuse multiple uh, different containers in your same system, um, so it's, it's a lot more flexible. So here is my my system. Um, looked from uh, here's a, a git directory for example uh, that has a few folders and the same thing you could see here um, there's my git directory and inside git that's what I have and that's because of the way I started the con this container and um, again to get that actually done and there are a few um, docker commands that you need to know about but I'm not going to cover them Again, here, instead, you can refer to the DS Docker uh, series or uh, 
of, of meetups uh, and then you will see everything about that. All right, so now the next thing is uh, you, you have a, you know, install Linux, you have your sharing files with uh, the Chrome OS system, you are running Docker and inside it you're running, and with Docker you're running, install Docker and with Docker you are running, for example, um, RStudio server and you're using it from the web browser offline. So now you want to connect to uh, GitHub and uh, and for that you need SSH keys uh, or uh, a, a different way to connect but you know in, uh, in many places uh, we use SSH because it is uh, a secure way to talk between computers and uh, so the way I do it you could do it in many ways including using RStudio to set up your SSH keys for great instructions about that I recommend the book Happy Git with R I personally use uh, the GH CLI so I install the GH CLI which is a command line that allows you to interact with GitHub from the terminal here is a link to the instructions to do that and then I authenticate with GH uh, out logging. So that will give me uh, a step-by-step -step, um, you know, guide to um, create SSH keys and to log in to GitHub with my, um, you know, as myself so that I can access all my private repos and everything. Then the next thing would be to configure Git. So you have to tell Git who you are. Uh, that is done in a file called git config, uh, which usually you manipulate it through git commands, something like git config. Uh, let's, let's see it here, how, how it works. So you could do something like git um, config. And then if you want a configuration that is global, you would do global uh, username, for example, and, and that's my name, uh, or user email, and that's my email. Those two, configurations are the minimum that you need to be able to create commits for example and so I did it once and then store that in a you know that goes to um, your configurations go to this file called git config that is in your home directory uh, I did it once and then store it in a repository called dot files and I uh, reuse those dot files so my git configurations are pretty long I have a few uh, few things that I like about uh, to configure about Git uh, and not only with Git I do uh, customizations for many other programs so I have stored all those uh, files in a repository called dot files you can watch a little more about what dot files are and how you can uh, you know basically inspect them save them and then reuse them here is a link to the video uh, so with uh, those configurations then your life will, on the terminal will be a lot a lot more uh, pleasant uh, I also use a bunch of other programs, in particular uh, oh my CSH, um, which makes terminal look like what you see here. For example, if I do a CD into git, um, let's say dsmis, which is the uh, repo that hosts this this um, meetup, uh, you can see immediately that it looks pretty cool, it has some colors, it shows the branch in which I'm staying, the git branch in which I'm standing. Uh, if I started a vanilla terminal, I wouldn't have information, for example, about the, the branch. To know which branch I'm using, I need to do a like git branch, uh, and only then I would know. So, um, yeah, that, that uh, comes from ZSH, uh, oh my ZSH, that customization that I do. Um, and I recommend you to also, um, you know, find the configurations that you want for all the programs that you use commonly, and then store them in a dot .files repository and reuse them. All right, so that's the end of the meetup. There are uh, a couple of takeaways to summarize the, the, this session. Uh, and it's this idea that you can do data science on a cheap Chromebook. Okay, there are limitations for sure, but they are relatively few, and mainly when you are working offline. All right, that's all for today. I hope that you enjoyed.